Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of Aborson by Garth Nix. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so you will be notified of all new videos, as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support Bearded Book Club, you could do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. Number one, you could become a patron and support us on a regular basis. Or number two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. This series is made possible by Cody Nimrod, who did just that, and sent us this novel. So without further ado, let us continue. Part 3 Chapter 17 Coming Home to Anchester Winds veering nor nor'east, sir, reported Yeoman Prindle, as he watched the arrow on the wind gauge, which was mechanically linked to the weather vane several floors above them. As the arrow swung, the electric lights overhead flickered and went out, leaving the room lit by only two rather smoky hurricane lamps. Prindle looked at his watch, which had stopped, and then at the striped time candle between the hurricane lamps. Electric failure at approximately 1649. Very good, Prindle, replied Lieutenant Drew. Order the switch to oil and sound general quarters. I'm going up to the light. Aye, sir, replied Prindle. He uncovered a speaking tube and bawled down it. Switch to oil, general quarters, I say again, general quarters. Aye, aye, came echoing out of the speaking tube, followed by the scream of a hand-cranked siren and the clang of a cranked handbell, both of which could be heard throughout the lighthouse. Drew shrugged on his blue duffel coat and strapped on a broad leather belt that supported both a revolver and a cutlass. His blue steel helmet adorned with the crossed golden keys emblem that proclaimed his current post as the keeper of the western light completed his equipment. The helmet had belonged to his predecessor and was slightly too large, so Drew always felt a bit like a fool when he put it on, but regulations were regulations. The control room was five floors below the light. As Drew climbed steadily up the steps, he met Abel Seaman Carrick rushing down. Sir, you better hurry. I am hurrying, Carrick, Drew replied calmly, hoping his voice was steadier than his sudden accelerated heart. What is it? Fog. There's always fog. That's why we're here, to warn any ship not to sail into it. No, no, sir, not on the sea, on the land. A creeping fog that's coming down from the north. There's lightning behind it, and it's heading for the wall. And there's people coming up from the south, too. Drew abandoned his calm, his calm, drilling into him with so much care at the naval college he'd left only 18 months before. He pushed Pat Carrick and took the rest of the steps three at a time. He was panting as he pushed open the heavy steel trap door and climbed into the light chamber. But he took a deep breath and managed to present some semblance of the cool, collected naval officer he was supposed to be. The light was off and wouldn't be lit for another hour or so. There was a dual system, one oil and clockwork, the other fully electric, to cater to the strange way that electricity and technology failed when the wind blew from the north, from the Old Kingdom. Drew was relieved to see his most experienced petty officer was already there. Coxswain Burl was outside on the walkway, big observer's binoculars pressed to his eyes. Drew went out to join him, bracing himself for the cold breeze. But when he went out, the wind was warm, another sign that it came from the north. Burl had told him the seasons were different across the wall, and Drew had been at the western light long enough to believe him now, though he had dismissed the notion at first. What's going on? Drew demanded. The regular sea fog was sitting off the coast, as it always did, night and day. But there was another, darker fog rolling down from the north towards the wall. It was strangely lit by flashes of lightning and stretched to the east as far as Drew could see. Where are these people? Burl handed him the binoculars and pointed. Hundreds of them, Mr. Drew. Maybe thousands. Sutherlings, I reckon, from the new camp at Lingston Hill. Heading north, trying to get across the wall. But they aren't the problem. Drew twiddled with the focused knob, clanging the binoculars against the rim of his helmet, and wished he could be more impressive in front of Burl. He couldn't see anything at first, but as he got the focus right, all the fuzzy blobs sharpened and began became running figures. There were thousands of them, men in blue hats and women in blue scarves, and many children dressed completely in blue. 
They were throwing planks onto the concertina wire, forcing their way through and cutting where they had to. Some had already made it through the no man's land of wire and were almost at the wall. Drew shook his head at the sight. Why on earth were they trying to get into the old kingdom? To make matters even more confusing, some of the Sutherlings who had made it to the wall were starting to run back. Has Perimeter HQ been informed about these people? He asked. There was an army post down there, at least a company in the rear trenches with pickets and listening posts spread out towards the back. What were the Pongos doing? The phones will be out, said Burl grimly. Besides, those people aren't the problem. Take a look at the leading edge of that fog, sir. Drew swung the binoculars around, the fog that was moving faster than he'd thought, and it was surprisingly regular, almost like a wall itself moving down to meet the one of stone. Strange fog with lightning illuminating it from the inside. Drew swallowed, blinked, and fiddled with the focus knob on the binoculars again, unable to believe what he was seeing. There were things in the forefront of the fog, things that might have once been people but now were not. He'd heard stories of such creatures when he was first posted to shore duty in the north, but hadn't really believed them. Walking corpses, inexplicable monsters, magic both cruel and kind. Those Sutherlings won't stand a chance, whispered Burl. I grew up in the north. I seen what happened twenty years ago at Bain. Quiet, Burl, ordered Drew. Carrick. Carrick poked his head out of the door. Carrick, get a dozen red rockets and start firing them. One every three minutes. Red rockets, sir, quavered Carrick. Red rockets were the ultimate distress signal for the lighthouse. Red rockets, move, roared Drew. Burl, I want every man but Carrick assembled outside in five minutes. Number three rig and rifles. Rifles won't work, sir, said Burl sadly, and those Sutherlings won't, wouldn't have got across the perimeter unless the garrison was already dead. There was a whole army company down there. I've given you an order, now get to it. Sir, we can't help them, Burl pleaded. You don't know what those things can do. Our standing orders are to defend the lighthouse, not to... Coxswain Burl, Drew said stiffly, whatever the army's failings, the Royal Alchesterian Navy has never stood by while innocents die. I will not start doing so under my command. Aye, aye, sir, said Burl slowly. He raised one brawny hand in salute, then suddenly brought it crashing down on Drew's neck, under the rim of the officer's helmet. The lieutenant crumpled into Burl's arms, and the coxswain laid him gently down on the floor and took his revolver and cutlass. What are you looking at, Carrick? Get those bloody rockets firing. But, but what about... If he comes to, give him a cup of water and tell him I've taken command, ordered Burl. I'm going down to prepare the defenses. Defenses? Those Sutherlings came from the south, straight through the army lines. So there's something already on this side, something that can f that fix the soldiers good and proper. Something dead, unless I miss my guess. We'll be next if they aren't here already. So get going with the bloody rockets. The big petty officer shouted the last words as he climbed through the hatch and slammed it behind him. The clang of the hatch was still echoing as Carrick heard the first shouts, somewhere down in the courtyard. Then there was more shouting and a terrible scream and confused hubbub of noise, yelling and screaming with the clash of steel. Trembling, Carrick opened the rocket store and wrestled one out. The launcher was set up on the balcony rail, but though he'd done it a hundred times in training, he couldn't get the rocket to sit in it. When, he w when it was finally home, he pulled too quickly on the cord to ignite it, and his hands were burned as the rocket blasted into the sky. Sobbing from pain and fear, Carrick went back to get another rocket. Above his head, red blossoms fell from the sky, bright against the cloud. Carrick didn't wait three minutes to fire the next one, or the next. He was still firing rockets when the dead hands came up through the hatch. The fog was all around the lighthouse by now, only Carrick, his rockets, and the light room above the wet flowing mass of mists. The fog looked almost like solid ground, so convincing that Carrick hardly thought twice when the dead creatures came smashing through the glass door and reached out to rend him with hands that had too many fingers and ended in curved and bloody bone. Carrick jumped and for a few steps the fog did seem to support him, and he laughed hysterically as he ran. But he was falling, falling all the same. 
The dead hands watched him go, a tiny spark of life that all too soon went out. But Carrick had not died in vain. The Red Rockets had been observed to the south and east, and in the light room, Lieutenant Drew came to and staggered to his feet as Carrick fell. He saw the dead and, in a flash of inspiration, pulled the lever that released the striker and the pressurized oil. Light flared atop the lighthouse, light magnified a thousandfold by the best lenses ever ground by the glass masters of Corvair. The beam shone out on two sides, bracketing the dead on the balcony. They screeched and shielded their decaying eyes. Desperately, the young naval officer slammed the clockwork gear into neutral and leaned on the capstan to turn the light around. It had been designed for this, in case of total mechanical failure, but not to be pushed by one man. Desperation and fear provided the necessary strength. The light turned to catch the dead full in its hot white beam. It didn't hurt them, but they hated it, so they retreated, taking Carrick's way out into the fog. Unlike Carrick, the dead hand survived the fall, though their bodies were smashed. Slowly, they pulled themselves upright, and on jellied broken limbs began the long climb back up the stairs. There was life there, and they wanted the taste of it, the annoying annoyance of the light already forgotten. Nick woke to thunder and lightning. As always in recent times, he was disoriented and dizzy. He could feel the ground moving unsteadily beneath him, and it took him a moment to realize that he was being carried on a stretcher. There were two men at each end marching along with their burden. Normal men, or normal enough. Not the leprous pit workers Hedge called the night crew. Where are we? he asked. His voice was hoarse and he tasted blood. Hesitantly he touched his lips and he felt the dried blood cake there. I'd like a drink of water. Master, shouted one of the men, he's awake. Nick tried to sit up, but he didn't have the strength. All he could see above were thunderclouds and lightning, which was striking down somewhere ahead. The hemispheres. It all came back to him now. He had to make sure the hemispheres were safe. The hemispheres, he shouted, pain spiking in his throat. They're safe, said a familiar voice. Hedge suddenly towered above him. He's got taller, Nick thought irrationally. Thinner, too, sort of stretched out like a toffee being fought over by two children. And he had seemed to be balding before, and now he had hair. Or was it shadow curling across his forehead? Nick shut his eyes. He couldn't think where he was or how he had got here. Obviously, he was still sick, more seriously ill than before, or they wouldn't have to carry him. Where are we? Nick asked weakly. He opened his eyes again, but he couldn't see Hedge, though the man answered from somewhere close by. We are about to cross the wall, replied Hedge, and he laughed. It was an unpleasant laugh, but Nick couldn't help laughing too. He didn't know why, and he couldn't make himself stop till he choked and had to. Beyond Hedge's laugh and the constant boom of thunder, there was another noise. Nick couldn't identify it at first. He kept listening to his stretcher bearers stolidly carrying him forward till at last he thought he knew what it was. The audience at a football game or a cricket match, shouting and yelling at a win. Though the wall would be an odd place to have a game, perhaps the soldiers at the perimeter played, he thought. Five minutes later, Nick could hear screaming in the crowd noise, and he knew it was no football game. He tried to sit up again, only to be pressed back down by a hand that he knew was Hedge's, though it was black and burnt looking, and there were red flames where the fingernails should be. Hallucinations, Nick thought desperately. Hallucinations. We must cross quickly, said Hedge, instructing the stretcher bearers. The dead can keep the passage for only a few more minutes. As soon as the hemispheres are through, we will run. Yes, sir, chorused the stretcher bearers. Nick wondered what Hedge was talking about. They were passing between two lines of his strange, afflicted laborers now. Nick tried not to look at them, at the decaying flesh held together by torn blue rags. Fortunately, he couldn't see their ravaged faces. They were all facing away like some sort of back-to-front honor guard, and they had linked their arms. The hemispheres are across the wall. Nick didn't know who spoke. The voice was strange and echoing, and it made him feel unclean. But the words had an immediate effect. The stretcher bearers began to run, bouncing Nick up and down. He gripped the sides and on the peak of one of the bounces used its extra momentum to sit up and look around. 
They were running into a tunnel through the wall that separated the old kingdom and Alchester. A low, arched tunnel cut through the stone. It was packed with the night crew from beginning to end, great lines of them with their arms linked, and only a very narrow, very narrow passage in between the lines. Every man and woman was glowing with golden light, but as Nick got closer, he saw that the glow was from thousands of tiny golden flames, which were spreading and joining, and the people farther inside the wall were actually on fire. Nick cried out in horror as they entered the tunnel. There was fire everywhere, strange golden fire that burnt without smoke. Though the night crew were being consumed by it, they did not attempt to flee or cry out or do anything to stop it. Even worse than that, Nick realized that as individuals were consumed by the fire, others would step into their places. Hundreds and hundreds of blue-clad men and women were pouring in from the far side to maintain the lines. Hedge was struggling ahead, Nick saw. But it was not exactly Hedge. It was more a head-shaped thing of darkness, limbed with red fire that fought against the cold. Every time he took... Every step he took was clearly an effort, and the gold flames seemed almost a physical force that were trying to prevent his crossing through the tunnel in the wall. Suddenly a whole group of the night crew ahead blazed like candles collapsing into a final pool of wax and disappeared completely. Before the people on either side could relink arms or new night crew rush in, the gold fire took advantage of the gap and roared out all the way across the tunnel. The stretcher bearers saw it and they swore and screamed, but they kept on running. They hit the fire like swimmers running from the shore into surf, diving through it. But though the stretcher and its bearers made it through, Nick was plucked off the stretcher by the fire, wrapped in flame, and tumbled down onto the stone floor of the tunnel. With the golden fire came a piercing cold pain in his heart, as if an icicle had been th thrust through his chest. But it also brought a sudden clarity to his mind and sharper senses. He could see individual symbols in the flames and the stones, symbols that moved and changed and formed in new combinations. These were the charter marks he'd learned about, Nick realized. The magic of Samoth and Lyrael. Everything that had happened recently rushed back into his head. He remembered Lyrael and the winged dog, the flight from his tent, hiding in the reeds, his conversation with Lyrael. He had promised her that he would do whatever he could to stop Hedge. The flames beat at Nick's chest but did not burn his skin. They tried to attack what was in him, to force the shard from his body. But it was a power beyond the magic of the wall, and that power chose to reassert itself even as Nick tried to embrace the charter fire, grabbing at flames and even attempting to swallow flickers of golden light. White sparks spewed out of Nick's mouth, nose, and ears, and his body suddenly uncurled, went ramrod straight, and flipped upright, elbows and knees vertically locked. Like some inflexible doll, Nick tottered forward, the golden flames raging at every step. Deep within his own mind, he knew what was happening, but he was only an observer. He had no power over his own muscles. The shard had control, though it didn't know how to make him walk properly. Joints locked, Nick lumbered on past countless ranks of burning night crew as more and more of them poured into the tunnel from the far end. Many of them hardly looked like night crew at all, but could almost be normal men and women, their skin and hair fresh and alive. Only their eyes proclaimed their difference, and somewhere deep inside, Nick knew that they were dead, not just sick. Like their more putrescent brethren, these new arrivals also wore blue caps or scarves. Ahead of him, Hedge burst out of the tunnel and turned back to gesture at Nick. He felt the gesture like a physical grasp, dragging him forward even faster. The golden fire reached out to him everywhere it could, but there were too many night crew, too many burning bodies. The fire could not reach Nicholas, and finally he staggered out of the tunnel away from the golden flames. He had crossed the wall and was in Alchester, or rather in the no-man's land between the wall and the perimeter. Normally this would be a quiet, empty place of raw earth and barbed wire, made somehow peaceful by the soft whisper of the wind flutes that Nick had always presumed to be some sort of weird decoration or memorial. Now it was wreathed in fog, fog eerily underlit by the low red glow of the setting sun and the flashes of lightning. 
The fog thinned in places as it rolled inexorably south, revealing scenes of awful carnage. The white mass was like the curtain of a horror show, briefly drawing back to show piles of corpses, bodies everywhere, bodies hanging on the wire and piles on the ground. They were all blue clapped and blue scarved, and Nick finally recognized that they were slain Sutherland refugees, and that in some horrible way, that was who Hedge's night crew had also been. Lightning crackled above him and thunder rumbled. Fog billowed apart and Nick caught a glimpse of the hemispheres a little way ahead, roped onto the huge sleds that Nick knew had been waiting for them when they offloaded the barges at the Redmouth. But he couldn't remember what hap that happening or anything between talking to Lirael in the reed boat and his awakening just before crossing the wall. The hemispheres had been dragged here, obviously by the men who were dragging them now. Normal men, or at least not the night crew. Many dressed in strange, ragged combinations of Anchesterian army uniforms and old kingdom clothes, khaki tunics contrasting with hunting leathers, bright colored breeches and rusty mail. The force that had propelled him through the tunnel suddenly retreated, and Nick fell at Hedge's feet. The necromancer was at least seven feet tall now, and the red flames burning around his flesh and in his eye sockets were brighter and more intense. For the first time, Nick was frightened of him, and he wondered why he hadn't been all along. But he was too weak to do anything but crouch at Hedge's feet and clutch at his chest, where the pain still throbbed. Soon, said Hedge, his voice rumbling like the thunder, soon our master will be free. Nick found himself nodding enthusiastically and was as frightened by this as he was by Hedge. He was already drifting back into that dreamy state where all he could think about was the hemispheres and his lightning farm and what had to be done. No, whispered Nick, what must not be done. He didn't know what was happening and until he did know, he wasn't going to do anything. No. Hedge recognized that Nick spoke with an independent voice. He grinned and fire flickered in his throat. He lifted Nick up like a baby and cradled him to his chest against the bandolier of bells. Your part is nearly done, Nicholas Sayre, he said, and his breath was hot like steam and smelled of decay. You were never more than an imperfect host, though your uncle and father have proved to be more helpful than even I could have hoped, albeit unwillingly. Unwittingly. Nick could only stare up at the burning eyes. Already he had forgotten everything that had come back to him in the tunnel. In Hedge's eyes, he saw the silver hemispheres, the lightning, the joining that he knew once again was the single high purpose of his own short life. The hemispheres, he whispered almost ritually, the hemispheres must be joined. Soon, Master, soon, crooned Hedge. He stalked over to the waiting bears and laid Nicholas down on the stretcher, stroking his chest just above his heart with a blackened, still-burning hand. What little was left of Nick's Altisterian shirt dissolved at Hedge's touch, showing bare skin that was blue with deep bruising, soon. Nick watched dully as Hedge walked away. No independent thought was left to him, only the burning vision of the hemispheres and their ultimate joining. He tried to sit up to look at them but didn't have the strength, and in any case, the fog was thickening once again. Wearied by the effort, Nick's hands fell to the ground on either side of the stretcher, and one finger touched a piece of debris that sent a strange feeling through his arm, a sharp pain and a gentle, healing warmth. He tried to close his hand on the object, but his fingers refused. With considerable effort, Nick rolled over to see exactly what it was. He peered down from the stretcher and saw it was a piece of broken wood, a fragment of one of the smashed wind flutes, like the one whose stump he could see a few feet away. The fragments was still infused with charter marks, which flowed over and through the wood. As Nick watched them, something stirred in the recesses of his mind. For a moment he remembered who he really was once more, and recalled the promise he had given to Lirael. His hand would not obey him, so Nicholas leaned over even more and tried to pick up the wooden fragment with his left hand. He succeeded for a few seconds, but even his left hand was no longer his to command. His fingers opened and the piece of the wind flute fell on the stretcher between Nick's left arm and his body, not quite touching on either side. 
Hedge did not walk far from Nicholas. He strode through the fog which parted before him, straight to the largest pile of Sutherland corpses. They had been killed by the dead that Hedge had raised earlier that day from the temporary cemeteries around the camps. He was amused by the notion of using Sutherland dead to kill Sutherlings. They had also killed the soldiers in the quaintly named Western Strong Point and the sailors in the lighthouse. Hedge had crossed the wall three times that day, once to set the initial attacks in motion in Anchester, which was no great task, second to go back to prepare the crossing of the hemispheres, which was much more difficult, and the third time with the hemispheres and Nicholas. He would never need to cross again, he knew, for the wall would be one of the first things his master would destroy, along with all other works of the despised charter. All that remained to be done here was to go into death and compel as many spirits as he could find to return and inhabit their, these bodies. Though Forward Mill was less than twenty miles away, and they should be able to reach it by morning, Hedge knew the Anchesterian army could, would attempt to prevent their breaking out of the perimeter. He needed dead hands to fight the army, and most of the ones who'd brought from the north and those created earlier that day in the Sutherland camp cemeteries had been consumed in the crossing of the wall, used up in order to get the hemispheres across. Hedge drew two bells from his bandolier, Sereneth for compulsion, Mosrael to wake the spirits who slumbered the here in no man's land, now freed from the chains of the hated Aborson's wind toys. He would use Mosrael to rouse as many as possible, though use of that bell would send him far into death himself. Then he would come back through the gates and precincts, using Sereneth to drive any other spirits he could find into life. There would be plenty of bodies for all. But before he could begin, he sensed something coming through the darkness. Ever careful, Hedge put Mazrael away, lest it sound of its own accord, and drew his sword instead, whispering the words that set the dark flames running down the blade. He knew who it was, but he did not trust even the bounds and charms he had laid upon her. Clore was one of the greater dead now. In life she had come under the sway of the destroyer, but in death she was somewhat beyond that control. Hedge had forced her obedience by other means, and as always with the necromancer's control over such a spirit, this obedience could be tenuous. Clore appeared as a shape of darkness that was only vaguely human, with misshapen appendages upon a bulking torso that suppressed two arms, two legs, and a head. Deep fires burned where eyes should be, though the fires were too large and too widely set apart. Clore had crossed the wall with Hedge the first time and had led the surprise attack on the Anchesterian army garrison in their western strong point. They had not expected an assault from the south. Clore had reaped many lives and was all the more powerful for it. Hedge watched her warily and kept a firm grip on Sereneth. The bells did not like to serve necromancers, and even a bell that an aborson would find steady had to be shown who was master at all times. Clore bowed somewhat ironically in Hedge's estimation. Then she spoke, a misshapen mouth forming in the cloud of darkness. The words were a gibberish, slurred and broken. Hedge frowned and raised his sword. The mouth firmed up and a tongue of blood-red fire flickered from side to side in the hideous maw. Your pardon, master, said Clore. Many soldiers are coming on a road from the south riding horses. Some are charter mages, though they are not adept. I slew those who came first and there are many more behind, so I returned to warn my master. Good, said Hedge. I am about to prepare a new host of dead which I will send to you when they are ready. For now, gather here all the hands that you can and attack these soldiers. The charter mages in particular must be slain. Nothing must delay our lord. Clore bent her great shapeless head. Then she reached back behind her and dragged forward a man who had been hidden by the fog in her dark bulk. He was a thin little man, his coat ripped off his back to show a classic clerk's white shirt, complete with sleeve protectors. She held him by the neck, just with two huge fingers, and he was almost dead from terror and lack of air. He fell to his knees in front of Hedge, gasping for breath and sobbing. "'This is yours, or so he says,' said Clore. Then she strode off, her hands reaching out to touch any dead hands that were close by. 
As she touched them, they shuddered and jerked, then slowly began to follow her. But they were surprisingly few hands left, and none at all in the tunnel through the wall. Clor was careful not to go near the brooding mass of stone that still shimmered every now and then with golden light. Even she did not take crossing the wall lightly, and possibly could not have done it without Hedge's help and the sacrifice of many lesser dead. Who, demanded Hedge, I'm, I'm Deputy Leader Gainer, sobbed the man. He proffered an envelope. Mr. Corlini's assistant, I've brought you the treaty letter, the permission to cross, to cross the wall. Hedge took the envelope, which burst into flames as he touched it and was consumed, gray flakes of ash falling from his blackened hand. I do not need permission, whispered Hedge, from anyone. I've also come for the... The fourth payment is agreed, continued Geener, staring up at Hedge. We have done all you asked. All? asked Hedge. The king and the abortion? D dead gasped Geener. Bombed and burnt in Corvair. There was nothing left. The camps near Forwin Mill? Our people will open the gates at dawn as instructed. The handbills have been printed with translation in Osdic and Chilanian. They will, will believe the promises, I'm sure. The coup? We are still fighting in Corvair and elsewhere, but, but I'm sure our country will prevail. Then everything I need has been done, said Hedge. All save one thing. What's that? asked Geener. He looked up at Hedge, but barely had begun to scream before the burning blade came down and took his head from his shoulders. A waste, croaked Clor, who was returning with a string of hands shambling behind her. The body is useless now. Go, roared Hedge, suddenly angry. He sheathed his sword, all bloody, and drew Mazrael again, lest I send you into death and summon a more useful servant. Clor chuckled, a sound like dry stones rattling in an iron bucket, and disappeared off into the night, a line of perhaps a hundred dead hands shambling after her. As the last one crossed into the forward trenches, Hedge rang Mazrael. A single note issued from the bell, starting low and gradually increasing in both volume and pitch. As the sound spread, the bodies of the settlings began to twitch and wriggle, and the mounds of corpses became alive with movement. At the same time, ice formed on Hedge. Still Mazrael sounded, though its wielder was already stalking through the cold river of death.